What do we do about these? Well, modern processes are designed to handle some in-field issues, right? We, have, we had a classic case with uh, Intel where they had a, a famous bug in the 90s, the FDIV bug, and as a result, um, microcode has become very popular as a means of providing in-field updates to processor behavior. The thing with microcode is it's not a magic bullet. It allows us to alter the behavior of certain instructions. So for example, if you have a floating point instruction that's not working correctly, sure, you can provide some patches to it. But if you want to change how your page table translation is happening, that's not something you can do easily in microcode. Um, so there are really some limits to what microcode can do. IBM has a similar concept. They call it millicode. And then the uh, risk-based processors, the ARMs and, and powers and, and some of the other processors out there, tend to uh, instead have uh, a lot of chicken bits that let you effectively chicken out, defeature certain things in the processor. So the exact way we mitigate issues will vary uh, from one architecture to another, but there's no magic bullet here. Um, so there's a lot of limitations, and we saw that with, for example, Meltdown, you know, where we had to go and modify all the operating systems to split the virtual memory. Uh, we couldn't just you know, patch microcode or change processor behavior. So current processes are really designed to correct traditional bugs not this class of vulnerabilities. So what can, do, what can we do in the future? Well, some of these things are going to have, quote, easy fixes, right? Relatively straightforward hardware fixes. Meltdown on L1TF uh, rely on speculation of certain privilege bits, for example, inside the processor ahead of time. And what I can do is, in that case, I can simply not allow uh, the dependent or subsequent operations after this permission check fails. Um, that's relatively straightforward. For Spectre Variant 2, I can increase the number of bits in my branch predictor so I no longer get aliasing between two different branches. Um, there are other tricks I can use there as well. Some of these issues have some real trade-offs. So, you know, some things may not make sense to do purely in hardware. For example, the so-called Variant 4, or speculative store bypass, um, also known as memory disambiguation, you know, that has a real performance hit to it. And it turns out the vulnerability there is really in, you know, sandbox code where I have effectively multiple different contexts within a single process. Uh, it, it may not make sense, in fact, it does not make sense to uh, restrict our ability to use this performance optimization just because somebody might be running a sandbox. And in some of these vulnerabilities, like port smash, you know, I'm not directly leaking data, I'm just inferring something about how another thread is executing. And again, it, it doesn't make sense to go and redesign our processors completely just because somebody might be able to run code on one thread and infer execution on another. Instead, it generally makes sense to just follow uh, you know, good guidance when we're writing, uh, for example, cryptographic code to harden it against some of these attacks. Over time, there will be new issues found. So what the researchers are doing is they're not standing still. They are looking out there at the leading edge in terms of computer architecture research, and they're saying, okay, uh, processors are beginning to increasingly perform value prediction, right? So I, I load a value into a register to perform some calculation, and maybe I predict what that value is gonna be. Now, historically, that wasn't heavily used, but it's increasingly being used. So what these researchers are doing is they're saying, value prediction is going to take off in the next few years. When that starts to be adopted, people will probably screw this or that up. And so they're starting to guess ahead of time, where will the future vulnerabilities be? Um, so this is not standing still, and we will find more issues. Um, one of the big challenges is solving Spectre Variant 1. I think that's going to be a huge problem. Uh, there's a reason they chose this ghost because it is going to be something that lingers in our machines uh, for a long time. Uh, there are various ways we can try to proceed. Of course, we could restrict speculation, um, AKA the 386 mode. It's probably not a good idea. Um, but there might be times where we want to uh, restrict speculation for certain critical sections of code. Um, some people are adding barriers. For example, you know, don't speculate beyond this point. To me, that's papering over the cracks, but it's a 
It's an important tool in our toolbox. And then there's some general hygiene around, you know, maybe what we should be doing is protecting the secrets, uh, not the code. So if we load a secret, let's make sure we don't keep it in the cache. Let's make sure we scrub that secret from, from our caches uh, very quickly after we finished using it. Uh, I had another idea last year uh, around solving Spectre Variant 1 using register tagging. I wrote a couple of uh, blog posts on it. You guys can certainly go and read that for a lot more uh, data. But essentially, it uh, involves uh, loading a value and then tainting it and saying, the value in this register is now tainted, and then tracking those taint tags through memory. And there's certainly some trade-offs there, but a lot of uh, future architectures uh, are already building um, aggressive structures for carrying tags through memory in any case. And so I think there are ways to layer it on top of that. Um, you know, so you'll, you'll load a value, you'll taint it, uh, you'll say the, va the value in this register should not be speculated upon. And uh, if you ever have to uh, write that back to memory, you then have to have a tag cache that you carry some of these taint bits through. Uh, more broadly, as I said, changes to hardware are going to be required. That is obvious. We are going to need to have a fundamental refocus on uh, security versus performance in this industry. Uh, there will be some that call for you know, completely new ISAs and new approaches based on uh, really uh, codifying timing-dependent timing behavior into our ISAs. Um, but changes to how we design software are also required. So we need to get away from you know, hardware people and software people, and we need to have some understanding in the software community of the challenges that face the hardware community uh, and the inverse. We need to communicate more uh, between the two so that we can head off some of these issues ahead of time. Open source can help, but open architectures won't magically solve all of our problems, right? I spent a lot of time working on ARM. I think RISC-V is great, but I don't think RISC-V is gonna magically solve all of today's challenges in computer architecture. That said, I do think it's a very useful way for us to collaborate as an industry in exploring new possibilities without some of the encumberments we otherwise would have had. And with that, I think there's five minutes left, so I'm gonna take a few questions. And I'd like you guys to consider the points on this slide about avoiding the us versus them mentality uh, while we do that. <laughs> 